Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice and Associate Justices, may it please the court. I, Mr. Rodriguez, along with my partner, Lance Valderol, will be representing Lee Harvey also in the case before the court today. On Friday, November 22nd, 1963, at about 12.30 p.m., shots were fired at the president, three people were hit, and President Kennedy died. Two days later, on Sunday, November 25th, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. Your Honor, there will be five points of error that I will be addressing in order to demonstrate that Lee Harvey Oswald was not guilty of this crime. First, all investigation was based on an alleged murder. Investigation was based on a presumption of guilt. Key evidence was ignored. Witnesses had mysterious deaths and few questioned the events and the evidence used in a court of public opinion could never be used in trial. Now, Your Honor, if we were to stop right here, we would have satisfied the foreign report we would have satisfied the media on that day, and we would have satisfied any kind of police investigation, if that's what you would call it, on that day. That being the FBI investigation, the Secret Service investigation, or the Dallas Police investigation. To my first point of error, Lee Harvey Oswald from almost 1230 on November 22, 1963, was not only the prime suspect, but the only suspect. Information was used by the press to manipulate the narrative to give the public the only logical conclusion that there was a lone gunman and that that was Lee Harvey Oswald. Only evidence that actually fitted to the narrative was included and a real investigation was not actually uh, started by them. Instead, a real investigation should actually investigate to obtain the criminal and not the other way around. They shouldn't investigate the criminal to obtain the crime. In this memo from Katzenbach, we can see what the actual intention of the Warren Commission was. The memo read, and I quote, the public, the public should be satisfied that also was the assassin and that he did not have confederates at large and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. Speculation about Oswald's motivation ought to be cut off and we should have some basis for rebutting the thought that this was a communist conspiracy or a right-wing conspiracy to blame it upon the communists. Unfortunately, the facts and also seem about too packed. The Dallas police have put out statements on the communist conspiracy theory, and it was they who were in charge when he was shot and thus silenced. Yeah. I think it can await publication of the FBI report and public reaction to it here and abroad. I think, however, that a statement that all facts will be made public property in an orderly and responsible way should be made now. We need something to head off public speculation or congressional hearings of the wrong sort. Now, Your Honor, this poses two questions. If the investigation was truly a real one, would you need to come up with a conclusion before you investigate? This memo makes it appear that the Warren Commission was never intended to investigate, but rather to come up with a story that would have the same conclusion that this memo was requesting. To my second point of error, Lee Harvey Oswald's whole investigation was based upon a presumption of guilt. This extensive media campaign that was set out by the media as well as all the newspapers and major magazines of the country pointed out that Oswald's investigation began as an investigation under the presumption of guilt. In Oswald's case, there was never the presumption of evidence. He was never granted that uh, reasonable doubt. In the US, a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty. This was not the case with Lee Harvey Oswald. He was deprived of that right. And as you can see in the following, fake evidence was used to persuade and key highlight stories were presented to the public so that they would be able to frame Oswald as the lone gunman and the murderer of President John F. Kennedy. They used different, different quotes, like for example, two days after the assassination, the New York Times ran a banner headline that read, in part, police say prisoner is the assassin. With a smaller but likewise front page heading, evidence against Oswald described as conclusive. The article quoted Captain Wolf Ricks of the Dallas Police Homicide Bureau as having said, we are convinced beyond any doubt that he killed the president, and I think that this case is clinched. It was phrases like these, Your Honor, that made the public believe anything that was coming out of the newspapers. For example, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported, police on Saturday said that they have an airtight case against pro-Castro Marxist Lee Harvey Oswald as the assassin of President Kennedy. And on the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch was the headline, Dallas Police Insist Evidence Proves Oswald Killed Kennedy. 
The Dallas police said that Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated President John F. Kennedy, and they have the evidence to prove it. The man killed President Kennedy. We are convinced without any doubt that he did the killing. There were no accomplices, Captain Fitz asserted, and Police Chief Jesse E. Curry outlined this web of evidence that he said showed Oswald was the sniper. Which means, Your Honor, that if this was truly what was going on, and if this is the way the public was perceiving all this information, the press had to be manipulated from the very beginning and part of this conspiracy against the president as well as the police. For how was the press gaining access to so much evidence to be used in a trial court um, against Lee Harvey Oswald if the police were the ones that were getting the tips? Oswald was never going to receive a fair trial. He was just never going to even make it in the first place. And according to eyewitness testimony, Many of the allegations that were brought in the newspapers were not really what happened on that day. Miss Earl Campbell, wife of the city mayor, who was also riding in the procession, saw a projection from a depository window, although she could not tell if this was a mechanical object or someone's arm. Now, what can we get out of this, Your Honor, is that from the public opinion and the pictures that were published on the newspapers, there was a there was kind of there was they already had a picture of what they were going to testify and how they could add on stuff to make it think together so you weren't getting actual testimony it was manipulated testimony that had some influence from the narrative that the newspapers were presenting on that day many eyewitness stories did not fit the commission uh the commission's final report and such witnesses were not included on the actual report for example Arnold Rowland, who saw the gunman 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived at the place. However, at this time, the man was in the far, um, in the far southwest window, and Rowland told the commission that another man then occupied the southeast corner left window. Miss Carolyn Walter saw the gunman to the right window shortly before the procession arrived, and however, she too saw a second man, and she also testified on a, an accomplice that was very different to the one of Roland's. But what is important to note, Your Honor, was that Oswald was not the only person on the sixth floor of the Texas School Depository on that day, which proves to show that this was bigger than just a one-man job. And Oswald couldn't have been the one that could have been guilty of this crime alone. And cross-applying the timeline on the, uh, at the sixth floor at 12.30 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963, it was simply impossible for Oswald to be at two places at once. He just couldn't have done it. If we were to cross apply Brennan's testimony as well, on November 22nd, 1963, Brennan was unable to identify Oswald as the man he saw in the window, but he picked Oswald as the person in the police lineup who bore the closest resemblance to the gunman. Months later, when he appeared before the commission, he mysteriously was able to recall that he could have made a positive identification of the November 26th lineup. That being said, Your Honor, this shows that many of the testimony was built and was uh, fixed before they had their final report. All of this was just to make sure the narrative was untouched and that the conclusion was that Lee Harvey Oswald was indeed guilty. To my third point of error, contradictory evidence was excluded. The problem, Your Honor, is that John Kennedy was hit both from the front and from the back. My co-counsel will further address that in his speech. In an inquiry that was made, whether from where uh, eyewitnesses were able to hear the shots, whether it be from the depository and the grassy knoll, we can see that those two areas clearly heard uh, shots as opposed to any other direction. Um, if Oswald is in the front, however, of the school book depository when John F. Kennedy passes, then he could have not fired the bullets from Kennedy. Now, shots from the front become very important because they are evidence that this couldn't be a one-man job. This newly released document proves that it was indeed a frontal shot that killed John F. Kennedy. Um, now, as you can see, Your Honor, the blood there does not match the picture. Uh, it is evident that it did go through uh, edits in order to make it look like blood was splattered whenever Kennedy was shot. This is film 313 of the Zabruder film. And uh, the fact that the blood is kind of spitting up is uh, a defy of gravity and it really shows that the film may have been tampered with before showing it to the public. In addition to that, there's also the pictures for the limo scene. As you can see, the blood was sprayed on the, on the seat instead of the actual front where the blood should have been um, according to the Warren Commission story. 
uh, to add on to the suspicion, the limousine was actually cleaned at the hospital. Uh, police arrived with buckets and cloths to clean the seats and wipe the blood away, which, might I add, is not only suspicious, but it's also tampering of evidence. Uh, they were trying to rid and hide something. But why clean a crime scene unless the blood spray doesn't fit the narrative, the Secret Service are working with the cover-up, and if anything, this proves that Oswald couldn't have had anything to do with it because he wasn't there at the time. So why would the police uh, be cleaning after Oswald? Now, there's a claim that Oswald was on the sixth floor and that he shot the president. Uh, if John Kennedy got shot from both the front and the back, in this Alkin 6 photo, we can see that he couldn't have done it, as it shows that Oswald was by the doorway when the, uh, when, when the car arrived. He couldn't have been um, drinking a Dr. Pepper in the second floor 90 seconds after the shots were fired. Now, this photograph proves that Oswald uh, was not on the sixth floor and that, according to Carolyn Arnold, her alib his alibi his and her testimony, Oswald couldn't have shot President Kennedy. Um, and if Oswald did not do it, this clearly proves a conspiracy. Um, this was a, a small a uh, fragment of what a British reporter found. Um, apparently, a British reporter had gotten an anonymous tip, and that anonymous tip proved to be right. Um, President Kennedy was killed, and uh, that was right before he was killed, the call he received. There was also the claim that Oswald hated Kennedy. Um, that is, again, it's immaterial to this case. Um, consider that Oswald praised John F. Kennedy at a public meeting, and there was many eyewitnesses could who could testify for that. On October 25th, 1963, Oswald accompanied Michael Payne to the American Civil Liberties Union meeting, and he actually praised President Kennedy for all of his civil rights work. Now, there's also the claim that Oswald got the Java Tech School book depository with the sole purpose to kill John F. Kennedy. Now, think about it for a second. It might make sense, but unless Oswald had aid or instruction from an outside party, he was not aware of a future presidential motorcade route um, if, as officials claimed, he was truly acting by himself. That was uh, classified information that was not available to the public until November 19th at the earliest. And uh, even if he did know by November 19th, that is little to no time to be able to do this, much less alone. The concept that Lee Harvey also was doing this alone is taken out by the idea that two Dallas papers had published two different routes. Um, these are the two routes that were published. and. Oswald is not clairvoyant, like he couldn't have guessed which route was the one to be taken on that day, unless there was someone from the inside telling him what to do. Uh, there's a, here's a short summary of the timeline of Oswald's activities from November 19th uh, to November 22nd of 1963. As you can see, he was a very busy man, and he simply did not have time to just sit down and plan out how to kill the president. Now, there's the claim that everyone heard three shots. According to Marianne Merman and Jean Hill, who were not only the closest eyewitnesses, but also two of the uh, key eyewitnesses uh, that were ignored, um, there were four or five shots. There's the, well, the, there's the question on how this is credible due to the fact that there's a different number. But what really should matter, Your Honor, is the fact that these eyewitnesses heard more than three shots. That fact alone is enough to show that the Warren Commission was trying to hide something from the public. So then again, Your Honor, according to their testimony, there was more than three shots. Why the Warren Commission tried to ignore that is questionable and, if anything, suspicious and proves that there was some kind of conspiracy within the government to hide the truth from the public. Now, the police claimed that it was an open and shut case. But I'd like to ask, Your Honor, if we were to take, for example, uh, Henry Wade's comments when he said, I figure we have sufficient evidence to convict them. There's no one else but him. Why wasn't there no one else? Why is it that they didn't search further? They didn't even try to look for more suspects. As soon as they apprehended Oswald, they were content and they were satisfied with their whole investigation. And according to the official story on how Oswald ran away, um, he ran away on a bus and on a cab. However, there is an eyewitness, Roger Craig, who remembered that he actually got on a station wagon and that he drove away on a station wagon. Um, 
Now, Mr. Craig is a very important eyewitness, as I will further address, because he was one of the witnesses that mysteriously died after they gave their testimony. Now, in, in this um, analysis by Dr. Jerry Croft, uh, he made a he made a kind of like a, a graph as to what were the percentages and the possibilities of a person dying of such cause at the time and compared it to the death of witnesses that died at the time for such cause. And as you can see, the numbers and levels are way too high and do not match what was possible at the time back then. Um, and again, going on to my fourth point of error, there was mysterious death of eyewitnesses that couldn't be explained and that were simply not really look that the police didn't really look into. Uh, for example, there was Karen Kupsinet who was found trying to place a distant uh, telephone call to a phone telling her about the murder of President Kennedy. And it was argued, however, that the suspect that killed her had been her actor boyfriend and that she had been killed strangled, but the police never really uh, took the investigation into their hands and her boyfriend was really never arrested nor charged for that matter. There was Grant Stockdale, a close friend of John and Kennedy who died on the 2nd of December, 1963, when he fell, or I, I believe was pushed from his office of the 13th story of the DuPont building in Miami. Uh, Dorothy Kilgan and Margaret Smith. Um, Dorothy Kilgan, a crime reporter from the New York Journal, obtained the private interview with Jack Ruby, and she told her friends that she had information that would break the case wide open. Of where what had happened to Bill Hunter and Jean Poe, she handed her interview notes to her friend Margaret Smith. On the 8th of November, 1965, Killigan was found dead. It was a reporter and she apparently had committed suicide. Her friend Margaret Smith died two days later. Is that a uh, coincidence? I think, I think not. Uh, again, as I previously mentioned, Roger Craig, he was found to have uh, killed himself with a shotgun, but how do you commit suicide with a shotgun and fire two shots once you've already shot the first one? Um, they never, the police never really tried to explain that and the public was just okay with it. Um, just some information and this is how you can see uh, how the photos could be altered and how the media was able to alter the perception. Um, Photoshop can be, Photoshop was able to be done back then as it is now. And finally, to my last point of error, the entire case falls apart against Oswald. Uh, it starts out with the assassination of J.D. Tippett, Your Honor. Um, it is clear that the Tippett murder scene is completely a mysterious uh, finding by the police as they did not find any evidence that would link Oswald to the murder other than his wallet. Um, but the problem was that Oswald was in the Texas theater when he was arrested. And now comes the question of the two wallets. Bob Barrett claims that Captain W.R. Westbrook asked him about the names Oswald and Hill while he was thumbing through the IDs of a wallet that he was holding at the tip of the scene. Interesting to note that Captain Westbrook was in charge of hiring officers and had a desk job. Uh, he was never on the field. However, on this day, he was here at the Texas Theater and at the Texas School Book Depository and later on went to work, uh, went to Vietnam to work for the CIA. Um, Apparently, the police alleged that Lee Harvey Oswald had two identities, and um, the two wallets were found on Oswald and one at the Tippett scene. But here's where the questions arrive. Would a person who just shot the president carry two wallets with him? Or would they throw the casings on the ground as to say, oh, I did it? Would they have even stayed in Dallas in the first place? Uh, what is the chance of catching a person in 60 minutes after the killing of the president? And if you do catch that person, why not look for another uh, suspect? Why not assume that there's accomplices and that this conspiracy could be bigger? Why, why is that? If Oswald did not have two wallets, uh, then this proves that there was clearly someone trying to frame him and that there was more to the parties that were against the president. Now, questions to be answered throughout this case, if Oswald was truly the one that did it, how did it all take place? How did an underemployed uh, worker shoot the president then escape by bus and cab to his rooming house? How does he pick up a pistol and kill the officer, but yet surrenders to the police at a theater? How does he die then two days later by the hands of Jack Ruby? The last question is the best to conclude on your honor. For 
if if indeed Lee Harvey Oswald did it, then there is very little uh, explanation that the police did. And your honor, to close up, Oswald was not the mastermind to orchestrate the murder of the president. It was only a small part of a large web. Was he probably in it? Yes, he probably was. But he was not the only one, and he was probably not the one that committed the shots. As I argued previously, he was not there at the time when the limousine arrived at the spot. The war report was a cover-up. Lee Harvey Oswald did not shoot a magic bullet. He was not a teleport that could be at two places at once, and he was not killing key witnesses after his death. He was not tampering with evidence to hide the truth from the public. That was all a lie. Lee Harvey Oswald was not the lone gunman. He must vote to free our nation from this tragedy and allow John Kennedy's soul to finally rest. Oswald was not the murderer. The war report was not accurate, and we deserve, we desire, and we need to know the truth today. If there are no further questions, I will retire. Thank you. I will now um, allow for my opposing counsel to present the first speech. Hello. Hello, my name is Rachel Tomasic. I am a student from HB Beale, and I am pleased to be representing the school alongside my grade 12 history colleagues today in this court. My colleagues and I will be discussing the first point of error, asserting that the Warren Commission came to the correct conclusion when they said Lee Harvey Oswald shot three times from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, hitting President Kennedy twice, killing him and wounding Governor Connolly. The President's Commission on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, informally known as the Warren Commission, was established on November 29, 1963 seven days after President Kennedy's assassination. President Lyndon B. Johnson issued an executive order to establish a commission to conduct a thorough and independent investigation so that American citizens would know the truth regarding Kennedy's assassination. This was to be done through collecting and analyzing evidence and drawing a conclusion about the Kennedy assassination. The Warren Commission accomplished this goal and it was correct in its conclusion. The Warren Commission, selected by President Johnson, was comprised of Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and six other representatives. All the members of the committee were known, trustworthy, and accountable public servants of the United States. According to the Commission's official report, these men were appointed to evaluate acts and circumstances surrounding the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963, and the killing of the alleged assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, by Jack Ruby on November 24th, 1963. To create its report, the commission reviewed reports by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Secret Service, Department of State, and the Attorney General of Texas. The commission compiled textual records, maps and charts, photographs, video, and sound recordings. In total, 364 cubic feet of records were compiled. The findings were then reported to President Lyndon B. Johnson on September 24, 1964, and the group was disbanded. The report provided the American people an objective report of the facts relating to the assassination. In doing this, the commission accomplished its goal in providing a concise, readable, and sound sequence of the events that occurred on November 22, 1963, proving that Lee Harvey Oswald shot and killed President Kennedy from his perch on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. To arrive at its conclusions, the Warren Commission carefully analyzed statements of eyewitnesses present at the shooting. Among these were citizens who were ahead of the Kennedy limousine, passengers of the first few cars in the motorcade, spectators standing on the side of the street, and employees of the Texas School Book Depository. Passengers ahead of the presidential limousine claimed shots came from behind and to the right, the direction of the depository. Others saw the rifle in the same direction after the shooting. Spectators on Houston and Elm Street saw the rifle on the sixth floor of the depository. A man who watched the motorcade near the window of the depository states, just right after this explosion made me think that there was a firecracker being thrown from the Texas bookstore. And I glanced up and this man I saw previous was aiming for his last shot. Employees of the depository who were watching on the fifth floor 
heard shots on the floor above them. Bonnie Ray Williams, who was one of the three employees, said, it is someone shooting at the president, and I believe it came from above us. There have been no credible reports of sightings of gun firing in any place besides the depository. Although some have claimed hearing or seeing another shooter, there has been no evidence to dispute the reports provided by the Warren Commission. The reports from the Warren Commission have not been disproven to this day. Besides multiple witnesses, all with solid claims, there is a collection of evidence from the sixth floor that further provides an indication of Lee Harvey Oswald's involvement, ranging from bullets, cartridges, and the gun. Police officers arriving shortly after the assassination found three empty cartridge cases at 1.12 p.m. near the window on the sixth floor. At 1.22 p.m., Deputy Sheriff and the Deputy Chief found a rifle with a scope on the sixth floor. Latin, latent fingerprints were found on the rifle, but were not identified as Oswald's until after the Warren report had been compiled. When the bullets shot at Kennedy and Connolly were found and brought in, it was a match to the rifle found on the sixth floor. Four experts in firearm identification concurred this through reenactments of the sixth floor shooting. Oswald was a part of the Marine Corps, and on December 21st, 1956, Oswald passed the Marine Corps accuracy test to become a quoted sharpshooter. Based on testimonies of experts and their analysis of the films of the assassination, the Warren Commission concluded that the shooter had to at least have the ability that a sharpshooter would have. The trajectory of the bullet that hit President John F. Kennedy and Governor Connolly is often derided as the magic bullet. It's easy expl easily explained when the positioning of Connolly's seat compared to President Kennedy is taken into account. The bullet did not have to quote it curve, but instead obeyed the laws of physics by going in a straight direct line through the bodies of the two men. In a computer ran simulation of the assassination, it is evident that the trajectory line does indeed obey the laws of physics, debunking all magic bullet theories. The evidence of the bullets and their trajectory, the gun, eyewitness reports, and a closer examination of the film still points to the fact that Oswald shot from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. There is more than enough sufficient physical evidence that undeniably placed Lee Harvey Oswald in the position as the sole murderer for President John F. Kennedy. Question witnesses at the scene of the assassination saw a rifle being fired from the sixth floor window of the depository building. Some witnesses even saw a rifle in the window immediately after the shots were fired. These witnesses make a majority of the perspective given, resulting in the most reliable feedback. A nearly whole bullet was found on Governor Connolly's stretcher at Parkland Memorial Hospital, along with two bullet fragments found in the front seat of the presidential limousine. These were both fired from a 6.5 millimeter Manlier Curcano found on the sixth floor of the depository building to the exclusion of all other weapons. This was the gun that Lee Harvey Oswald was proven to have fired and had owned, directly putting Lee Harvey Oswald and his gun at the scene of the crime. The three youth cartridge cases found near the window on the sixth floor at the southeast corner of the building were fired from the same rifle. The windshield in the presidential limousine was struck by a bullet fragment on the inside surface of the glass, but was not penetrated. This aligns with the evidence of the bullet fragments that were found and provides a reality with the further evidence. In records of the autopsy, the nature of the bullet wounds suffered by President Kennedy and Governor Connolly 